Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is our third session about centrality. We're looking at our sense of being a person in the world. And today we'll look at how that personhood connects with a sense of relationship with other people and really with the whole natural and civilized world. We'll look in particular at the body core and the feelings that arise there and the life that it contains within. We are sensitive creatures who respond to the environment and in particular respond to one another. This is the basis for what we call society. Let's begin. So centrality is our topic. And we're looking at this feeling of being a person or a me. This has a lot and perhaps everything to do with our embodied existence as human organisms. But different regions of the body engage this sense of personhood or me in different ways. In the last session, we looked at how the so-called head body engages our sense of identity. We've seen how there is a very complex network of nerve cells in this organ we call a brain. And how one function of that organ is to develop a sense of narrative or storyline that helps us make sense out of our world and our experiences. That narrative story about ourselves has a lot to do with our ideas and our sense of being a me in the world. But there's more to it than what the head provides. Other regions also participate in this sense of personhood. And in particular, today we'll look at how the body core engages our identity and contributes to it. The body core has a lot to do with how we relate to one another. We are, after all, relational beings who engage in all sorts of interactions with other people and other beings and indeed the whole world. There's a sense of relationships either feeling supportive and positive or unsupportive and negative. And a lot of that feeling comes directly from this region I refer to as the heart body. In the next talk, we'll look at the lower region, the lower belly and pelvic region and how it connects us with the earth and how that contributes to our sense of personhood. But today I want to isolate our attention and look at this region that we refer to colloquially as the heart. So each of us has within our heart region a feeling tone that tracks our relationships. That feeling tone has two aspects to it that we have already seen. There is an inside direct feeling of that relational quality. But there's also something that we could see as more objective or from the outside, which has to do with physiological changes, such as in blood pressure, heart rate, muscle tone, hormonal balances, and so on. So our relational qualities relate to both what we feel directly and what we know from biological and medical studies to be going on in the organism as different relational states come and go. I want to let go of the idea that there's a huge difference between these two aspects of relational experience. Instead, I'd like to start bringing things together as one. When we talk about the body core and this relational sensitivity, we really are isolating our attention to some degree on this region between the neck and the pelvis. Within that region, there is a dense network of nerve tissue. Some of this comes from the famous vagus nerve that you may have heard of, and some of it comes from other neural structures. But there is a lot of nerve tissue within the body core. In fact, it's estimated that there are about as many neurons within the body core as there are within the brain of a dog, which gives you some idea of its internal intelligence. 
Now, one task of all that nerve tissue is to manage our physiological functions. So, for instance, there are controls placed on the beating of the heart, speeding the heart up and increasing its contraction when we're needing more energy, perhaps under situations of various forms of stress, and slowing the heart down and relaxing its contractions when we're more at ease. At the same time, another aspect of this heart region is the emotional feeling tone, the sense of warmth and support, for instance, that we get when we're with someone that we feel is a safe and caring person. Now, we are emphasizing the neural activity within the body core in this talk, but of course, there's a lot that also connects with the brain, in particular with the regions of the brain that are known to modulate emotional experience, collectively referred to as the limbic system. But we won't emphasize the limbic system so much in this talk, and instead, we'll emphasize the neural intelligence of this body core. Now that neural intelligence involves more than just neurons. It also involves muscle cells, immune cells, and many other cells in the body. So the nerve tissue in the body is continually communicating with all the other cells. It's worth, therefore, at this point, considering a little bit the nature of a cell. As is widely known, the cell is the fundamental unit of life. All living organisms have cells. And all cells have within them structures that they share in common. They also have functions that they share, the capacity to take in nutrients and expel wastes, for instance. Now, the cell is the basic unit of life. And that means that it is possible for a freely living life form to consist of just one cell. And we see an example here, the well-known paramecium. It has just one cell in its entire body, and we're watching as this organism, consisting of that one cell, is moving through its environment, picking out bits of food in order to sustain itself. To my eye, this looks fairly similar to what we might see of a water bird, like a duck, kind of paddling around in a circle, picking out bits of food in the environment, again, to sustain its life. Now, cells, of course, don't usually live in complete isolation, even when they're single-celled organisms like this. There generally tends to be some interaction. So here we see two paramecia, and we watch them kind of jostle in this relatively confined space, and one gets the sense watching this that the organisms are aware or responsive in some sense to each other's presence, that they kind of move in and investigate and accommodate and sometimes perhaps kind of elbow one another in ways that I think we can imagine to be somewhat similar to the ways that we might engage people in, for instance, a farmer's market or something, kind of coming up, sort of investigating one another with sidelong glances, sometimes kind of jockeying for position a bit, etc. So these characteristics of engagement between two organisms appear to begin right down at the single-celled level. So too do some decision-making capacities. Here we're watching another single-celled organism attempting to engulf a large plant cell. And at some point it realizes that this cell is simply too big, it cannot engulf the whole thing, and so a decision is made, and it backs off and moves on to seek nutrients elsewhere. This capacity to sort of attempt something and then make a decision that the attempt isn't going to succeed and cut one's losses and move on is, again, a behavior I think we can all identify with as multicellular creatures, but which appear to be present even in this very simple single-celled organism. So when we go back to the body core and think about it as human beings and what's going on in there and why do we feel what we feel, on some level, we can keep in mind that there is a cellularity that is at the heart of all this experience, and that indeed that cellularity involves relationship, not just between us and the people and other beings and processes around us, but also a relationship amongst the cells that are within the body core, our human cells, and indeed even non-human cells, such as the bacteria that constitute our microbiome. So there's a lot of relational activity going on. 
And we can feel this directly in the core of our body. And this can be a nice meditation to simply sit still in a comfortable posture, in a quiet place, with eyes either closed or downcast so that we're not distracted. And just feel into the region of the heart and the belly and notice the aliveness and the fluctuating tone of pleasant and unpleasant that arises and falls as we think about different aspects or as our body state changes. There's a lot of sensation within the core. Now, if we're very heady in our habits, if we tend to be quite oriented toward thought and ideas, it may take some practice to center our awareness and begin to feel directly into the core. But it is a skill that can be cultivated. And I say this from experience, having begun as a young adult, uh, very much in my head, and having gradually over the years moved more and more into this direct sense of bodily experience. I should also point out that if one has suffered a lot of trauma in one's past, and especially in one's childhood, feeling into the core may cause experiences of distress. And if those are very strong, one needs to consult uh, a professional, such as a trauma-informed therapist, in order to get some assistance dealing with those strong interior experiences. Going back to this tissue, this intelligent tissue within the body core, for us as mammals, it has a lot to do with how we relate with other beings, in particular others of our own species. One of the characteristics of mammals is a lot of social engagement with one another. Now, some mammals are relatively isolated as adults. They live apart from one another, not in social groups. But all mammals have a period of nurturance during their infancy where there is a lot of social interaction with the mother and often with others of the family and group. The tissue within our body core monitors and modulates all of that and allows us to resonate and respond to the beings around us. So here we are as human mammals, engaging one another in ways that sometimes feel positive and supportive and sometimes not. When we do have an experience of positive support, we tend to feel in our body core rather full and smooth, expansive and happy. Now that's not always our experience. Sometimes we get angry, frustrated. Sometimes we get frightened scared. Under those situations, the experience isn't so round and full and satisfying. It's much more jagged, much more alarmed. Another possibility is that we can feel isolated and cut off and alone and sad. Then the experience is more droopy, wilted, downcast. So this is a very simple description of states that we're all quite familiar with. You certainly don't need me to tell you that we can feel happy or angry or scared or sad and so on. But I do want to kind of explore this from the sense of what's going on in our body core. Because there are, after all, cells in there that are somehow related to these experiences. A lot of them are nerve cells, but as already mentioned, many other cells get involved. The cells communicate with one another in various ways, including direct neural connections and other forms of direct contact, but also quite often through chemicals that circulate in the bloodstream and through the body fluids. When we're feeling full and satisfied and happy, these chemicals tend to have a certain profile. The names of some of them are probably familiar to you, like oxytocin or the class of chemicals that we call endorphins that are related to opioids. These give pleasant feelings of satisfaction, connection, resonance, joy, and so on. When we're feeling more agitated, different chemical profiles come into play. And here we're dealing with chemicals that have to do with stress, like adrenaline, also known as epinephrine, and cortisol. These are famous stress hormones, and they tend to cause rapid heart rate, muscle tension, feelings of agitation, and so on. The situation is a little more complicated when we feel sad or depleted or downcast. In some sense, there's a loss of activity in certain neurochemicals, such as serotonin and dopamine, although there may be an excess of others, such as cortisol, the stress hormone. But the overall feeling is one of depletion. So we have these different chemical states that are related to the feeling tone that we have within our body core and indeed throughout our body, but particularly located around the region of the heart and belly under different relational circumstances. Again, whether we feel 
supported or at risk or isolated. I'd like now to look at this from another perspective. For simplicity, let's imagine that we have three emotional feeling states. In the middle is the full, happy, round, smooth, satisfied state. To the left is the jagged, agitated, fearful, or angry state. And to the right is the isolated, lonely, sad, depleted state. The body core acts as a indicator. It helps us understand our social situation. And it does so by offering up these three states. Of course, in reality, there are many more than just three, but we're making things simple for purposes of illustration. At some times, we are happy and satisfied, comfortable, safe, supported. And so the dial, so to speak, is in the middle. Other times, there is agitation, anger, fear. Things get jagged. Other times, we do feel sad, wilted, depleted. Of course, we prefer the state of happy fullness. There can even be a temptation to lock ourselves into that state, to insist upon it, to refuse to notice when we're angry or sad. Some people cope in this fashion, project into the world and to themselves a constant upbeat frame. Personally, I've never really been capable of that. And when I see others doing it, I sometimes get the sense that it is a little bit forced, a little bit too rigid and locked in. It lacks the fluidity of natural flowing life. And indeed, I think it can often feel quite tiring to have to maintain a happy front and a happy sense of things at all times, because of course, life isn't always so happy uh, in its circumstances, at least. A more natural situation is that we fluctuate. And sometimes we do feel a little sad and depleted. And sometimes we do feel happy and sometimes angry, and then happy again, and then lonely again, and happy, and frustrated, and so on. We go back and forth. Now, we do have some ways of influencing the internal state and what it is telling us about the circumstances around us, our relational world. If we tend to focus a lot on things that make us angry or frightened, of course, that will push the dial one way. And if we focus on things that feel lonely, lots of memories of loss, we'll feel sad. That's quite natural. What can be helpful then is to orient from time to time on the supportive aspects of our environment. The people that do care about us, either now or that we remember from our past. The earth herself, which supports us holds us up from below, provides oxygen and food for us. And the mere fact of having a physical body that gives us this ongoing and rather miraculous experience of human life. If we continue to orient toward sources of safety and support in our environment and even in our body, for instance, the feet, the soles of the feet often are not afflicted by negative emotions. There's a sense of groundedness there. If we orient toward these feelings of groundedness, safety, and support, we can modulate our own interior experience and emphasize the smooth, full qualities and de-emphasize the jagged or depleted ones. The idea here is that we are sensitive organisms. As infants, we come into the world with this sensitivity already built into us. One of the most immediate experiences of an infant must be this raucous quality of dealing with a lot of different interior states, sometimes feeling happy and pleasant, sometimes feeling hungry and irritable, and all of that is going on. And of course, at first, a little infant doesn't even have a sense of identity yet to deal with all of that. But the responsiveness is quite clear to anyone looking that the baby is sensitive. 
Now that sensitivity, of course, is responsive to the relational environment. When the primary caregivers, when the family is supportive, both of one another and of the little baby, this leads to an experience of happiness, quite naturally. But that's not always the situation. Sometimes there are arguments and conflicts within a family that's perfectly normal and common. And during those periods, the baby may very well respond with feelings of stress and alarm and fear and frustration, etc. And sometimes the parents or the other caregivers get distracted. They're too busy with their work or they're busy socializing with other adults and the baby feels a little neglected and isolated and this can be sad. None of that is an insurmountable problem. Provided that overall there's a relative balance between the different states and a predominance of positivity, this can help the little one learn to negotiate the changing circumstances of life and the changing interior feelings. In fact, it's important for the little one to learn how to manage different states and not to always expect that there's going to be harmony. This tends to tune the baby toward relatively frequent states of fullness, happiness, radiance, joy, safety, etc. That's the ideal. Now, things, of course, are not always ideal. Sometimes there can be too much conflict. Parents can be continually arguing, or even worse, there can be direct anger and abuse directed toward the child. When that happens, speaking very simply here, we could say that the system gets tuned toward a state of agitation, particularly of fear, but maybe also frustration and rage. And that can be a habitual response for the person or the organism throughout life, if it gets baked in, as it were, early on. Alternatively, the environment can be one of a lot of neglect. Parents may be uh, overly uh, attached to their work, not really paying enough attention to the infant, or at least not enough of the right type of attention, that is to say, emotionally resonant and supportive. Or they may, even worse, have substance abuse issues, perhaps, that lead to frank neglect. Either way, what happens again is a kind of tuning of the organism very early in life towards states of loneliness, isolation, depression. Now, there can be all sorts of variations on these themes. Some people can have tendencies both toward a lot of agitation and towards a lot of depletion. That would be typical, especially of a highly chaotic and traumatic and neglectful childhood. And some people, of course, won't deal with so much of this locked in conditioning toward extreme states. Whatever the mix of early impressions that we come into the world or into adulthood with, it influences our storyteller. That is to say, the way we interpret and make meaning out of our lives will be flavored by how we were tuned early on, whether toward happiness and fullness, or toward agitation, or toward sadness, or some mix. So that sensitive being that we are in our body core will now have to deal with two influences. One is the conditioned sort of tuning toward various states of experience, and another is the habitual story that we tell ourselves, you know, how we interpret circumstances as they come. Now, if we were raised in a way that activated us or depleted us on a habitual way, and so that got kind of baked into our tissues, the stories that we tell will tend to emphasize difficulty. So here we're looking at a car crash and we could imagine either being angry and, and terrified of this or just fundamentally sad and despondent as a result of all this chaos and damage. If many of the experiences that we have get interpreted with this kind of storyline, of course, that's just going to emphasize the negative feeling tone and diminish our capacity to stay centered in states of fullness and satisfaction. But what can be very helpful here is to notice what's really going on. That image that I show of the car accident is a still taken from the production of one of the Transformer movies. And you might not have noticed this, but I'm highlighting now, and some of the filmmaking equipment is visible to one side of the image. 
if we can remind ourselves that the story that we're telling ourselves is in fact a story, it isn't necessarily true in every sense of the word, it's an interpretation, we can take it a little less seriously and restore more of a balance to our system. In addition to noticing the effects of the story and disidentifying from the story and its consequences in our mind and body, we can orient, as mentioned earlier, toward support and safety in our environment and in our bodies. As mammals, we do have the capacity to rest comfortably, feeling safe, feeling nourished, feeling supported by the earth, by the people around us, by our own bodies, by our own mammalian life. As we orient toward areas in our body that are not affected by painful emotions, like the soles of the feet. As we orient toward people that care about us, either now or in the past. As we orient toward the support of this beautiful planet. We can begin to emphasize feelings of fullness and warmth and safety and de-emphasize the jaggedness of fear and anger or the wilted quality of loneliness and sadness. So what can happen then is that we can move away from being so strongly locked into one or another pole of extreme experience and spend more time in the middle. We can emphasize our capacity to live in states of fullness and joy and de-emphasize our activated states of fear and anger or our depleted state of sadness, loneliness, or grief. And then we can move as needed you know, into those less pleasant states as circumstances cause us to react, because they will, but we can be better and better at restoring the sense of centrality. So this is actually a different meaning of the word centrality than I've been using. We've been looking at how centrality gives us a sense of self, but at a certain level, there is also the centrality of maintaining the middle path, the zone between too much activation and too much depletion. And actually, our most authentic being, the one that we're born with, a feeling, trusting, having some faith in the world, has a lot to do with this middle zone. And this kind of centrality, therefore, is important to the larger sense of personhood or me-ness. Because when we are able to notice that life does have an ongoing quality of supportiveness, after all, there's always an atmosphere around us. That's supportive. There's always an earth beneath us. That's supportive. As we start to orient toward the support, rather than the periods of agitation or depletion, we become more in touch with the centrality of life itself, which is, after all, the centrality of our most authentic nature. And all of this, at some level, is cellular. Not just our nerve cells, but all the cells in our body are contributing to this experience. So are all the chemicals that circulate throughout the body. And this can be another meditation. We can meditate upon the experience of life.